welcome to TYT. I'm Anna Kasparian, I'm back. Yeah. Jake is not though, he's not here. But Nando Vila and Maitha Al Hassan are here Hi. to do the show with me, super excited. Um, we're gonna start off with some fun. Uh, yeah. We're gonna discuss Laura Loomer, uh, a person that I was completely unaware of until uh, fairly recently. But Nando uh, is an expert on I'm Laura an expert Loomer. on Laura Loomer, I've right. celebrated her career from day one. Um, <laughs> and I just, I, I'm very happy we're discussing her on the show. I think she's a very important figure who deserves serious, serious discussion on shows like The Young Turks. Right, so look, we're starting off with Laura Loomer because we want some comedic relief before we get into a discussion about what's happening in Gaza. And the misinformation that is being spread by the right wing, Katrina Pearson being one of them. Mm. And then later on in the show, we are going to juxtapose old Biden videos with old Bernie Sanders videos. Uh. And I think it's important to do that because as the mainstream media props up Biden, I think it's super important for people to know how different these candidates are and what their priorities are. So I'm looking forward to that, that'll come in the second hour. Brett will join us for, for that discussion. So, fun. you guys yeah. ready, you excited? Yeah. All right, let's start off with some fun. Laura Loomer was among the right wingers and conspiracy theorists that Facebook decided to ban recently. Now we can have a discussion about whether or not that makes sense, but before we do it, I think it's important to show you what Loomer's reaction was to this ban when she was recently interviewed on Alex Jones's show. Let's take a look. Well, they're just trying to kill us. You wanna know what they're trying to do, they want us dead. And I hate to make it all about myself, but I have been defamed, okay? My life has been destroyed, my life has been ruined, Alex, by people who have defamed me online. I am 25 years old and it will probably be like this for the rest of my life. But what are they doing? I wanna know what people are actually going to do. My life is ruined. Does anybody understand how ruined my life is? I'm sick of it. I don't wanna listen to people tell me that I'm a conspiracy theorist. They don't know what it's like to be me. My life is ruined, Alex. No, I understand. I just think you need to go with it. But at least the president is concerned about it. Okay, he's concerned about it, but that's not gonna stop the fact that I've lost 90% of my income. That's not going to stop the fact that I literally can't make a living anymore, even though I have a degree. I was valedictorian in college. I graduated top of my class in my journalism program. And I'm sick of it. I'm fighting harder than most conservatives. I'm fighting harder than anybody. And I'm being destroyed. And they mock me and they say I'm some crazy conspiracy. Well, that's what These people don't understand. Like, my life is unlivable at this point in time. Like, what is the point. My life now, I have to worry about getting murdered by leftists and Muslims every single time oh, I go outside. Oh, it's disgusting. Oh, I know, I know, they're so protected, it's so That's sick, it's so sick. Oh my God. There's so oh. much to unpack here because- So good. The reaction from Alex Jones is something that you found interesting, you're gonna comment on it. Yeah. Uh, but before we get to that, I just wanna make a quick serious note. So she's arguing that she's been defamed, mm -hmm. right? But understand whether you agree with what Facebook did or not, she has not been defamed in any way. She has said things that have been horrific towards certain communities, especially Muslims. And she herself has actually defamed people like Representative Ilhan Omar. In one tweet, she said the following, let's go to graphic three. After 9-11, we said never again. Ilhan Omar is only pushing for another 9-11, yeah. right? And she also um, incited violence toward Representative Omar, uh, writing things like, we need some patriots to rise up and protect our constitution so we can prevent the establishment of a caliphate. <laughs> you know, trying to push this narrative that a Muslim lawmaker is gonna push for a caliphate. Obviously, that is not what Representative Omar is doing. So while she's crying her crocodile tears, uh, and arguing that she's being defamed, she has made money from defaming others and inciting violence toward them. So I just wanted to make that serious point. And now let's have fun. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, a, you're a new. I know. Yeah, I was just gonna say I'm one day old, knowing who Laura Loomer is. But just a quick survey of the things that she's done to be provocative, to be disruptive. This seems like you know you you dealt it. Deal with it. Right. I you mean, smelt it. I smelt it. So yeah. It. Yeah. I'm. I'm. That's, yeah. Proverbial. I'm right? so bad at proverbs. Anyways. <laughs> um, uh, 
there's just so much to dig into. One thing is that if we could at some point get a screen shot, a grab of the image of her on Alex Jones' show and Alex Jones, because then that's like the Facebook 20 year age challenge. <laughs> if she continues to be that riled up, right. that's what she's gonna look like. Yeah. Um, Why are you comparing Alex Jones's face? I mean, that's what like- He's 45 years old, she's 25. He looks like he's in his 50s. Anyways. Um, she, uh, she's been banned by Venmo, PayPal, GoFundMe. I don't know, a couple summers ago, if you guys remember that Shakespeare in the Park was disrupted. Mm -hmm. It was it, because it was her. She came onto the stage and she said that this play was, um, was normalizing political violence against the right during the assassination of Caesar because she said that they were trying to portray Caesar as a Trump-like figure and that this was all Shakespeare was propaganda, so Shakespeare was, you know. Are you serious? Yeah, makes <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, uh, I just love Alex Jones's reaction. Was like Alex Jones is like, who is this crazy woman mm -hmm. on my show? Like, I mean, if you if your <laughs> rantings make Alex Jones think you're insane, then uh, you know it's uh, you're doing a really good job. I mean, I think it's worth reminding people that Laura Loomer chained herself to Twitter HQ, and it's like a to protest her banning from Twitter, like she was like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, uh, protesting uh, British colonialism, and uh, and she snuck into Nancy Pelosi's house and camped herself in the backyard to protest immigration. Yeah, that story, I was completely unaware of that, <laughs> and I, I have to be honest, I, I can't imagine anyone else getting away with something no. like that. You're you're trespassing onto private property, the private property of a lawmaker. I mean, if that was a person of color, let's keep it real, he or she would be gone. Murdered, yeah. Right, right. And then even if they're trying to walk into their own house, like Henry Louis Gates tried to do exactly. in his Cambridge home, they also could potentially be arrested for trespassing. So. Right, right. But let's talk about um, you know, who the real victim is, Matha. <laughs> yeah. And the real victim here is poor Laura Loomer. Let's yeah. hear a little more from her. Do people not understand that those of us who have been silenced have actually taken legal action? Oh, I don't think I don't, they get it's a total war. I want people to actually do something. Okay, we need your money, we need your support. Help fund my lawsuit, give me some money to fund my lawsuit. And that's what this is really about, yeah. right? Money, 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 what am I gonna do? Please feel sorry for me, this is my livelihood, but no one no one pressured you to put out the type of propaganda, the type of lies, the type of incitement that you put out. Yeah. You did that on your own. And you were warned previously from the very platforms that banned you to just cut it out, cut yeah. it out. We, we want you to stop and if you stop, we're not gonna ban you, but she continued. In fact, uh, let's go to graphic two. An Instagram spokesperson said the company had removed one of Loomer's Instagram stories in which she recorded herself calling Islam, quote, a cancer on humanity for violating its hate speech policy. The spokesperson added that if Loomer continues to violate Instagram's rules, her account could be banned. This is from April of this year. So she had been warned, hey, yo, like, cut it out. And she decided to continue doing it. So I'm tired of the oppression Olympics from the right wing. I mean, I'm. I'm tired of it, yeah, right? Yeah, a bunch Just, of snowflakes. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting about this too is that Shakespeare in the Park incident where she got up on stage and she knew that she was going to actually be charged, which she was. Six hours prior, there was that website, I think Free Loomer mm -hmm. was, was bought and was um, activated. And she raised $12,000 yeah. um, to free her. So she's used to getting bailed out all the time for her antics and for getting a lot of media attention for it too. And to kind of come out pretty unscathed. So I think she's dealing with the fact that she there are consequences in this world to riling up hate speech. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that yeah. Shakespeare was the original uh, radical Antifa. <laughs> but uh, um, I think I think there is like some there is like some discussion to be had about the appropriateness of Facebook and Twitter and all these guys like banning right wing political people because what's going to happen in effect is that they're going to end up eventually banning a bunch of left wing people and it happens yeah. all the time. Um, and I don't I haven't quite made up my mind about how what's the best way to do that. So um, I look, of course, we always go back to the difference between the government and private companies. And so, you know, if you want to bring up the Constitution, obviously the Constitution doesn't apply when it comes to private companies. But that doesn't mean that I, I don't, uh, you know, that I agree with what Facebook right. did. So look, for me, there's a, a, a 
line that that gets crossed by a lot of a lot of right wingers. So hate speech is one thing, and I don't think people should be banned simply for hate speech. Mm -hmm. But I do think that people should be banned for inciting violence. Because if you're encouraging your followers to commit acts of violence, well then A, even the US Constitution doesn't protect that. And B, I think that these platforms have a responsibility and an obligation to do their part in keeping communities safe. And so yeah. that's for me, that is the line. And so that's why I was in favor of someone like Alex Jones getting deplatformed because he had been inciting violence mm -hmm. toward some of these, you know, Sandy Hook parents. And the Posner family had to move seven different times because his fans were constantly going after them, threatening them with acts of violence, and it wasn't okay. Yeah. So for me, again, that's the line. I guess it's just that, you know, in, in Facebook and all these companies are private companies, like you said, but the internet is has become sort of the public square mm -hmm. and the public square that has been essentially dominated by private companies. So it's so it's a very weird kind of situation where there is some I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I haven't made up my mind on it. And like, of course, like inciting violence, like we can all agree that that's wrong. But what does inciting violence mean? Like people said that Ilhan Omar's comments incited violence. Obviously, we wouldn't think that. But like, that's up to the people who are in power to decide, and they'll decide what that means, and they'll often turn that kind of rhetoric against the left. And you know, and that's that's just what we've seen time and time again. So I don't, again, like I don't know what the what the right way to go forward is. I think the question is also, if we're operating in this public square scenario, what space are they taking up in the public square? Are they a newspaper stand? Are they a publisher? They're taking money for ads. They're taking money in the traditional way that mm -hmm. a publishing company would as well. And there are standards around what information gets um, um, viral or trends or gets published. So mm -hmm. we haven't been able to determine what these social platforms would be under in terms of jurisdiction. Yes, that's that's such a good point. And you know, I just want to quickly reference the importance of policies similar to what Elizabeth Warren wants to do, which is to break up these platforms. Yes, yeah. that, Please. Because <laughs> if you break up the platforms, understand if you are a publisher of news content, right? right? That is your your main objective as a company, well, there are certain guidelines and certain laws that you have to ad adhere to. So for instance, if someone on this show straight up lied about someone else, right? Just slap them in the face. <laughs> made something up, well, there are laws protecting the individual who was just defamed. There are defamation laws, right? right? And so in, in that context, there's actual uh, laws that you can refer to, but with Facebook, with Amazon, with all these big companies, they do so many different things right. and they need to be broken up. Yeah. That way they can be dealt with appropriately or the different components of the businesses can be dealt yeah, with. As a first step, it seems crazy that Facebook can own Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp right. at the same time. I mean, like that's like a seems like a easy first step in terms of because like people always ask, well, how do you break them up under what's like, well, they keep on acquiring other companies that are enormous. You can just start by re-separating them the way they were in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And and I do also agree with those who are concerned about what this is doing in hindering conversations that need to be had. Yeah. But again, those conversations that might be controversial uh, should be treated very differently from what I've been seeing from some right wing voices where again, they encourage violence or encourage action toward those that they disagree with. Uh, and let me give you a list of uh, Laura Loomer's conspiracy theories because in mm. the middle of her meltdown, she Fun. she claimed, "No, they're calling me a conspiracy theorist, and that's not what I am." Okay, that is what you are. Uh, <laughs> here are some of the conspiracy theories uh, that she spread on social media. She claimed that the shooting in Santa Fe, Texas, was staged. Mm. She claimed that the shooting in Parkland, Florida, was staged. Fun. She claimed that the Las Vegas shooter was affiliated with ISIS, which was not the case. And also that Caesar Sayoc, who was uh, the individual sending pipe bombs to various Democrats and CNN, uh. is affiliated <laughs> with Antifa when, of course, we all know yeah. that he was a giant Trump supporter. Yeah. His social media accounts and also the van that he was uh, driving around in 
indicated he was a huge Trump he read supporter. Hamlet, you know, he read Hamlet and became Antifa. Yeah. You know what's really wild about these conspiracy theories about the mass shootings as false flags is that they insist that these are happening to introduce um, gun control laws to get rid of the Second Amendment, and we've not moved an inch <laughs> yeah, around any one. of them. Yeah, I know it's amazing. Uh, the biggest failure of a false flag <laughs> operation. Yeah, the worst. Right? Yeah. We got to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to get into uh, the situation in Gaza. Uh, unfortunately, violence broke out over the weekend, and uh, we're also going to give you and debunk some of the misinformation from right wingers. Come right back. We hope you're enjoying this free clip from the Young Turks. If you want to get uh, the whole show and more exclusive content while supporting independent media, become a member at tyt.com slash join today. In the meantime, enjoy this free segment. Welcome back to TYT. One of my favorite musical artists, Pitbull, says you gotta spend money to make money. And I would argue that you gotta put your money in a financial institution that pays you interest. And that's what Aspiration does. Aspiration is a financial institution that will pay you 2% interest on your checkings account. I'm serious, okay? They won't charge you fees. And I think that's pretty incredible. So just go to aspiration.com slash TYT, open up that account, earn that money, okay? Because make your money work for you. Why wouldn't you do that? All right, uh, I also wanna read some members' comments and some TYT lives. Uh, let's start with Stacy. Perhaps she, sh meaning uh, Laura Loomer, I assume, perhaps she uh, should have taken that valedictorian journalism degree and done some actual journalism. She just needs to pick herself up by the bootstraps and quit crying <laughs> like an entitled snowflake needing a safe space. Oh. <laughs> no, but like, you guys don't understand the level of salt in these, <laughs> in these messages is incredible. Yeah. J.M. Frazier says, I don't want to hear people calling me a conspiracy theorist, she said in an interview on InfoWars, <laughs> right? <laughs> By the way, one other thing about Alex Jones's reaction to her, I feel like he was a little jealous. Like he was a little jelly that she was out crazying him in that yeah. interview. He's like, yeah. there's only room for one screaming maniac, <laughs> and that's me. Uh, Lucifer Vaughn says, "Oh my God, you got banned from Facebook. Seriously, Facebook? Who cares? Go to a bar and dance." Whoa! <laughs> Damn. Pork Chop Express writes in and says, "If you have a degree, was a valedictorian, and chose to be a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> that's on you, boo." <laughs> Love it. And then uh, TYT Live uh, novice 05 says, "All Loomer needed to do was keep it to dog whistling, and she would have been fine, but she couldn't even do that." That's true, that's probably true. That is true, yeah. definitely. All right, uh, now we move on to a much more serious story. Violence broke out over the weekend uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, specifically in the Gaza Strip. Um, now, according to reports, at least 22 Palestinians, including militants and children, were killed in Gaza over the weekend. And four Israeli civilians died in the fighting. CBS News has more details on this story. Let's take a look. Israel's military struck back. Hitting about 350 targets in the Gaza Strip. One of those Palestinian targets had been riding in this car. Israel's military says it was a senior Hamas figure. It was the first targeted assassination by Israel since 2014. Palestinians say an infant was also killed in one of the airstrikes. Her body was carried in a funeral procession. Her father said the children were playing and were struck by a missile shot from a drone. So Israel is claiming that their actions were their retaliation against Hamas, that Hamas had initially launched you know, airstrikes against the Israelis and they were essentially reacting to that. And of course, as we've seen in previous cases, their reaction is usually pretty disproportionate. They have more in terms of military capability and they have more in terms of defense capability. But nonetheless, you know, Lives have been lost and they have reached a ceasefire, uh, but the ceasefire 
is, I think, vulnerable. I think that uh, any little provocation on either side will lead to uh, more violence. But I'll give you more details on that in just a minute. Um, Maytha, jump in, give me some uh, details on all this. Well, I think people have to remember because there's always this obsession about who started what at what point, did Hamas, did Hamas launch rockets, did Israelis start, you know, there was always a Hamas prov provocation. People have to remember that the blockade started in 2007 and what the blockade is. The blockade is blocking out people in an open air prison where they can't come in and out. Even their water sources where they go fish for their, their, um, their food, there's a certain distance they can go and then they'll be shot by the Israeli military. So they are in an incredibly dehumanizing, vulnerable situation where their food rations are also determined in terms of what comes in and out. There's massive unemployment. So they have very little recourse to shift and change what's going on in their lives. And I guess at certain points there are rocket launches, but there's, like you said, Anna, a history of disproportionate violence because you're talking about a nation state's military versus you know, a, a violent organization within the country, within Gaza. I mean, I just wanna give you some updates. Um, you were talking about 24 people, uh, 20, 24 people were killed on the Palestinian side, four Israelis, um, and that includes uh, two pregnant Palestinian women and the 15 month old that you saw. But also, if we go back, the report mentioned 2014, there were 2,104 Palestinians that were killed, 495 children, 72 Israelis. And you keep on going back 2012, 2009, and you see that same kind of disparity in terms of lives lost. So you have to ask yourself, what is different between the two sides and how can that help us move forward on a path towards peace? And usually it's not that the side that has the least amount of military grade equipment um, has the burden of doing the most restraint. It's usually the one that is carrying. Right, and, and also I think that it's important to put yourself in the shoes of people living in the Gaza Strip who are dealing with the ramifications of that blockade. So it's easy to say, well, Hamas uh, struck first and they get what they deserve, which, you know, and I'm not trying to say this to excuse what Hamas did, but you have to understand the motivations behind what they did. Because if you create a situation in which a group of people are desperate yeah. and they feel like they have no other choice, well, of course they're gonna act out in, in the ways that we've seen. And instead of thinking about, hey, this is a symptom of an issue that we need to find a solution for. Benjamin Netanyahu's reaction has been to be even more brutal and more cruel toward the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And I think the other thing that you have to realize is they're in a blockade and people assume that people are in a territory that they are from. 70% of the people in Gaza are refugees from other parts of what is quote unquote Israel, right? And so they are being cut off from their family members, they're cut off from where they are from and like you were saying, cut off from the rest of the world, including food sources. So you have to imagine this is like a prison uprising, right? Prison uprisings can be violent, but they come from somewhere. They come from certain kinds of conditions that people are living through. Yeah, I mean, the the, the whole situation is uh, unbelievably depressing. I mean, there was just the the elections in Israel very recently, and it was you know Netanyahu won again, but the the election the election choice was basically between. You know the extreme right wing Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, who also supported the occupation, is not really calling for a two state solution or anything like that. Like, which was the sort of mainstream position throughout my whole life. Right. You know, and now, now the de facto conditions on the ground make it seem like the two state solution is a pipe dream. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it. They've created the conditions where where that just can't happen at this point. Exactly, and that cycle of violence will only continue unless there is, you know, at least a consideration to change course mm -hmm. by by the Israeli government. And what Netanyahu and the Israeli government is doing right now is putting the lives of Israelis, of Israeli yeah. citizens in danger. Understand that. He is doing that. If he genuinely cares about the lives of Israelis, he would First of all, at least consider changing course and, and consider how his actions are leading to these, uh, these uprisings that we're seeing by Palestinians. But of course, he's not interested in doing any of that. Let's
Let me just quickly talk about the ceasefire. Um, according to Arab news reports, uh, a new ceasefire was brokered by Egypt and the United Nations. Um, this is being reported by the New York Times and it includes measures to ease the acute economic crisis in the impoverished Gaza Strip. And I wanna give the New York Times a little bit of credit because they're finally um, at least mentioning the fact that there are um, serious economic issues uh, that the Palestinians are facing. Also, uh, one other note that I wanted to mention was, was that there's concern that Benjamin Netanyahu is not really taking the ceasefire seriously. So uh, first Hamas said that they agreed to the ceasefire. Arab news reports uh, included uh, news that there was an agreement about the ceasefire, but there was no statement from the Israeli government for a while. And then finally, when Netanyahu did release a statement, it appeared that he was, uh, let me give you the exact wording. He said, the campaign is not over, meaning the campaign to um, retaliate against the Palestinians in Gaza, and it demands patience and uh, sagacity. We are prepared to continue. The goal has been and remains ensuring quiet and security for the residents of the South, meaning uh, you know Israel. I send condolences to the families and best wishes for recovery to the wounded. So even in that statement, he is threatening more acts of violence against the Palestinians. And this is again, after the ceasefire had well, been reached. He's campaigned on annexing the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could say that he was going extreme right to capture a certain voting block, but he did tell us his intentions and in annexing an area that Palestinians are living on means that he is down for more violence. So it's clear that Peace is not what he is concerned with, and I think also a lot of, especially American Jews who are progressive, know that mm -hmm. and have been starting to seriously question um, the relationship between Netanyahu and Trump and their own, um, the, the way that they look at Israel and what Israel's been doing to Palestinians because of that tight knit um, relationship. And, you know, Trump responded very quickly, stating his. Support for Netanyahu. Of I, I yeah. don't know if we have the quote, but it's no, think, it's, it's pretty obvious. But I think that yeah. that's a, that's that's an important factor because I, I I you said you mentioned maybe the Israeli government has to change tack or whatever. They simply won't unless there's pressure from the from the American government. And there never will be pressure from the American from government. From this current regime, at least, yeah, maybe. I don't. I mean, look, maybe unless, a future president Bernie Sanders might do something, but right. Um, but let me let me just be clear about one thing. Unless we get money out of politics, nothing will ever change in terms of the US response to the Israeli government, if we have a right wing Israeli government, as mm -hmm. is the case right now. And the reason why I say that is because look at Obama, even Obama, you know, during his administration, tried to criticize the Settlements that were being built yeah. in the West Bank and John Kerry and yeah. John Kerry and think about yeah, and they had the a revolt from their own party in Congress. And Thank you. Yeah. So they yeah. they did not get the support from their own party, and yeah. you have to look at what the influences are behind the scenes, and it's important to bring that up. Um, it it Im impacts every single foreign policy issue that our government is involved in, and Israel is no different from mm -hmm. that. Um, so let's. Let's just move on to the second part of the story that is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Following violence over the weekend between the Israelis and the Palestinians, right wingers, including Katrina Pearson, felt the need to spread all sorts of propaganda and misinformation about what was really going on. In fact, she had tweeted the following, 650 rockets being fired into Israel from Gaza in an attempt to overwhelm Israel's Iron Dome, 173 intercepts, four people killed and 28 wounded. What is Ilhan Omar? Or what is her response to this violence? Will she condemn it? Okay, so that was the text of the tweet, and she also included a video. And this is the video that she included. Let's take a look. I mean, that's compelling video, right? Yeah. Um, or at least it would be compelling if it were a video used in the right context, because that was video from 2015 in um, Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. 
It yeah, wasn't I, from the weekend. It wasn't from like the Star Wars uh, Empire Strikes <laughs> Back, the Battle of Hoth, like the AT-AT walkers coming in. You know, that's that was the original v tweet. Well, she see. said she posted it because she thought that Americans didn't know what rocket launching looked like. So they needed a oh, they needed Americans, that as yeah. context. Oh, oh, I that was her. I have a response. I'm going to read you a verbatim what she had <laughs> uh, responded. But of course, it was a fake video, and I want to give credit to all the people on Twitter who called her out on it. Uh, one of those people was Ben Norton, uh, and he wrote, "Wow, it's a crazy video from Ukraine. Nice try, Trump spokesperson." So then she responds because she, Ben Norton was the, wasn't the only person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a flood of people uh, calling her out, and she said, "700 rockets now," and no. I'm not their geniuses. <laughs> the video is used as a GIF to underscore what hundreds of rockets would look like to Americans. She's <laughs> yeah, it was just a meme, guys. Don't you get it? This is like, you know, this is how the kids share information these days. They do the memes with the text and the, the thing, and then the GIFs of like, you know, like Beyonce going like, oh my God. You know, like that's like, that's that's what it was. That's exactly what that was. It's a celebrity rocket. Yeah, yeah. you know, like, yeah. The original tweet is still there. Yeah. And. It, this is so. This is par for the course. I mean, I, this is what you can expect from the right wing. And the end of that tweet, she mentions Ilhan Omar again, and that's what I really want to talk about yeah. because something like this happens, and immediately, from the right wing and members of establishment media want to know what Representative Omar and what Representative Talib have to say about it. What are they? What are the two Muslim members of Congress have to say about this? Yeah. First of all. What does anyone have to say about it? Why is it that we immediately jump to Representative Omar? Are you trying to imply that Representative Omar thinks that violence against Israel is okay? Because she's never said that, never said that once. She has the audacity to bring up the treatment of Palestinians, which is you know legitimate, her concern is legitimate. And immediately everyone jumps down her throat. It's absolutely breathtaking to me that this year alone, there have been two mass shootings at synagogues uh, targeting American Jews by the hands uh, at the hands of uh, right wing nationalists in this country, right wing white nationalists in this country. And they're still obsessed with insisting upon the fact that anti Semitism is a thing of the left and of Ilhan Omar specifically, you know, where there's been actual violence perpetrated against American Jews uh, in this country from the right wing. And that just doesn't even even doesn't more da even more damaging, they're trying to link some of her old tweets to motivating those mass yeah. shootings at synagogues, which clearly have no relationship because they were white supremacists who did those violent acts. And so that's what's really disingenuous about this. Do you have Ilhan's tweet? That yeah, I do. So let's let's actually take a look at what Representative Omar and Representative Talib had to say about the violence over the weekend. Omar writes, how many more protesters must be shot, rockets must be fired, and little kids must be killed until the endless cycle of violence ends. The status quo of occupation and humanitarian crisis in Gaza is unsustainable. Only real justice can bring about security and lasting peace. That was <laughs> that was a mainstream position like 15 years ago. That was like the the most utterly mainstream thing to Absolutely. say. Absolutely, and look, she's concerned with ending cycles of violence. She's concerned with peace. Her, and she mentions the rockets. Right, right, right. But what they would probably attack her for, knowing how the right wing um, reacts uh, to people like Ilhan Omar, is her use of occupation, the word occupation, the status quo of occupation, because she's framing the situation as one uh, that they probably wouldn't jive with. And then the other thing is that she does, her and Rashida Tlaib frequently talk about settlements being a barrier to peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are not down with that either. And so they are narrating it as violence. And in this moment, I very much think about what Malcolm X is popularized for saying. Um, this is December 1964, he said that the press is so powerful in its image making role. And here we can just think about the right wing in this case on Twitter. It can make the criminal look like he's the victim and the victim look like he's the criminal. Mm. Wow, I mean yeah. that definitely applies to the situation. If there isn't a serious attack on, on Omar or Talib's life, like within the next five years, like I'll be absolutely shocked. Like at this point, like with the president and his tweets about Omar and what like the entire, I mean, and in, in many ways, the way the liberals have kind of provided cover for the criticisms of Omar. Um, I mean, they're just creating a situation in which 
something bad is going to happen and it's 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 absolutely shocking and listen there are other muslim members of congress but they don't receive this kind of hate um, because they're not women of color. They're not women of color who refuse to step down after they've taken a position. And like Ilhan Omar has said, I didn't get elected to Congress to be silent. I got there because I am, my my constituency believes in what I'm arguing for on their behalf. Right, exactly. So they knew who they elected yeah. and I like the consistent attacks on her and Rashida Tlaib are just, they're, I just, what, I have no words. What I want to understand is why it's offensive to refer to the occupation as, as the an occupation. occupation. Because it's, it's accurate and it's truthful. It's one of those like words have no meaning thing anymore. You know, like, you know, what's, what's going on in Venezuela is not a coup. What's going on in, in Gaza is not an occupation. It's just like, we can just change the meaning of words when it's like, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to the border of the Gaza Strip uh, before and it's like, you know, that doesn't sound, that doesn't look like a free, uh, open society, it, it looks like an absolute, like an open air prison, like you said. Well, because when you use terms like occupation, it is a violation of international law. You know, Amnesty International has called the blockade on Gaza an illegal blockade. And I think that's the thing that they're up against, which is that these international organizations have laws that aren't necessarily enforceable, but they are globally damning. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's very true. And I want to make sure uh, to read Rashida Tlaib's uh, response to what happened over the weekend. When will we hold, when will the world stop dehumanizing our Palestinian people who just want to be free? Headlines like this and framing in it, um, and framing it in this way just feeds into the continued lack of responsibility on Israel who unjustly oppress and target Palestinian children and families. And the reason why I want to read that to you is because she made a really great point about a, a headline that was, in my opinion, incredibly biased. So let's go to graphic nine. This was by the Washington Post. Death toll rises as Gaza militants fire hundreds of rockets into Israel, which responds with airstrikes. Mm. Um, and just to give you another example, uh, the Los Angeles Times wrote, intense rocket fire at Israel Gaza border leaves at least uh, 27 dead in two days. That The LA Times one isn't as bad, no. but I do think that the Washington Post headline um, should be called out because it's so one sided. It makes it appear as if the Palestinians are 100% the aggressors, they're 100% in the wrong. The Israeli government has been nothing but great to them, and that's just not true. It's the uh, it's the abusive husband that uses the "look what you made me do" uh, excuse, you right. know, like "look what you made me do," or like the "stop hitting yourself," like with your little brother when you like hit him with his own arm, you know, yeah. like "stop hitting yourself," "stop hitting yourself." Well, I think it's also unfortunately at this point for like decades of programming believable. There is this sense that. The Middle East is geography of violence. That's why would they always say that Israel is the only democracy in the region. We have to protect them. That's how we protect the rest of our interests in the region, which isn't true either. And so it's believable when you hear that Palestinians are aggressors. It's believable to hear that Gazans are aggressors because you are inundated with these headlines day in and day out. And so that's when it becomes irresponsible is we can't have a vision of a humane sort of telling of what the Palestinian side has suffered. When we come back from the break, I will share with you a story involving the US government provoking Iran into war. Fun. <laughs> Lots of fun, yeah. Um, and we have more for you. Uh, make sure to use the hashtag TYT Live to tweet to us during the break. We'll be right back.